you stop me at any time at all, ask me a question, ask me to clarify, there's no problem at all, all right? Which means it's very simple. We be humble each other. And what, what can be more important than letting the children have what they deserve? Not just something that we're generous enough to give them, but they, they have a right to it. You know, we have so much resources, and it's a pity that so many people are starving. So, just have a little right, right back to the very beginning. And these means is non-denominational. So it's, it doesn't belong to any denomination. And we feed children of all denominations and none. And we take money from people of all places. <laughs> and no, we're not a person. So, these means has a lovely history. And I'll just give it to you uh, quite briefly. Way back in 1982, around that time, it was reported that people were saying that Our Lady was appearing in Medjugorje. And there was a gentleman over in Scotland, my father and father family, and Ruth read two lines in a local paper, and she said, imagine this, could this be like the roots of Fatima, but in our time? And so they pestered their parents for permission to go out to investigate this in their own way. So they went out. It's amazing too how, how the world has changed that Mr. and Mrs. McFarland and Barrett allowed these children to go away way back in the early 80s. And the oldest in that group was 16. Magnus was the younger, 12. And uh, so they, they went out anyway. They had no big, wonderful experience. Except that they found that people were very joyful, a lot of love in that place, and they came back with the idea that they should they should pray more, they should be a, a more united family, and so they, the children, began to pray more. And the McFarland Barrows were were ordinary Catholic people; they were uh, attending mass and so on, but they were not not next to ordinary about them. And that first year. Uh, Magnus's parents, uh, Callum and Miriam, were so impressed with their children, says, we better go out and check out this place for ourselves. So they went out. And both of them had a similar experience, but not at the same time. Both of them felt drawn to change their house. They had a, a guest house, a very old, rickety house, uh, called Craig Lodge. And both of them felt in, in the empty of each other, a call to change it from being a guest house to being a house of providence, living on, on whatever God would give them, and uh, invite people to come and experience God, the house of prayer, especially for the young people. And so they changed their house from the guest house into Craig Lodge, and they, they uh, invited people to come. So we fast forward a wee bit. Magnus is a good bit older now. He's a in his 18s, early 20s, and the Bosnian War. Remember we used to 
going to Bosnia during the war, 23 times in total. And uh, by the time they had finished, he, he, he was driving a big lorry at this stage in and out of Bosnia. And uh, one of the people who, who came with him on the trip was a young nurse. And uh, she, uh, she was very interested and she says, what can I do to support you in this young charity vest? She says, I'm a qualified nurse, what can I do? And Magnus is driving the lorry and he says, what we need is drivers. So she went and she got her heavy boots vehicle before he had these the little L plates and she got the uh, full license and now she's a wife and she still slides him about that. So, quite a few times in and out, thankfully the war ended. And Magnus had started up because of the financial reasons and keeping good governance and all that, started up Scottish International Relief, SOR SIR, Scottish International Relief. So Scottish International Relief now was that sort of a loose end. There were still materials <coughs> coming in, donations were coming in, but the, the cause that they were set up for had ended, thankfully. So Magnus was in different places and looking to see how he could use the materials that were uh, donated. And so he was in different countries around the world, and one time in, two, in 1990, in 2002, he ended up in Malawi. In 1992, Malawi had a severe famine. It was uh, extreme. And lots of people were starving, and uh, five million people were at risk of, of starving to death. In Malawi, a priest asked him would he visit this hut that belonged to a lady called Emma. And Magda said he would. And so he visited Emma. Emma had four ch five children, and the oldest boy was Edward. Emma was dying of AIDS. Africa is, uh, is still being devastated by AIDS, but in 2002 it was very bad. What happened was the men would go to the city to get a bit of work. They would play away from home, as it were, get infected. Then when they would come back to have relationship with the wife, they would infect her too. So there's so many orphans in Africa. So when Emma was dying, her husband had already died, and she asked Magnus, Will you pray that somebody would take care of my children after my time? And Magnus he is a man of faith and said, I would pray for that intention. And then he turned to Edward, Emma's oldest boy, 14 years of age, and asked a question that all of us as adults have asked children a hundred times. What do you want to do with me? And Edward said, I would like to go to school someday and I would like to have enough food to eat. And that was Edward's sole ambition in life. To go to school someday and to have enough food to eat. And that one line is the beginning and the cornerstone of Mary's needs. This is what instructed Magnus create this wonderful work that God is using to change the lives of millions of young, of young people. And so Magnus wondered how he could make Edward's dream come true. And he came up with this idea, by no means does Magnus McFarlane claim that this is original, but this is the idea that he came up with, that if he could bring food into Edward's local school, that Edward would want to go to 
200 children in Malawi in the year 2002. And last January, January 28th, our new figures came out, and we are feeding now every day in the place of education 1,425,013 children. That was January the 28th last. Three weeks ago we were talking about this, and already that figure has gone up by 50,000 since January 28th. So we're feeding that amount of children. So Mary's means work by bringing food to school. But we are a no frills charity. And by God, if you get involved with Mary's means, you know what no frills means no frills. My, my friend was telling me the other day about great idea he had about raising money. He would buy something and then he would sell it for a bigger price. And I said, that's great, but we don't buy things. If you want to give it to us, we'll take it. We'll sell it for a bigger price, but we, we buy it off. Right? We have no frills at all. And so we <coughs> how it works, how we can keep the cost down. We can feed the child in a place of education for 15 euros and 60 cents. That means that we're feeding a children for a full school year for that figure. What Mary's means, the average cost of a meeting is 7.9 cents. Depending on which part of the world you're in, it can go up to 10 cents. But you might be trying to feed the child in this country for 10 cents. A couple of weeks ago I was in the Lisbon National School and I was explaining to the children about the age fees in this week for that. Just out of the bush, I said, I want to do it some of them. And you've got a tiny spot and you have 2 euros and 20 cents. So I said, do you think, you could tell me how many children that would feed? And they thought for a while, they said, that would give 22 children a meeting. It's amazing what can be done. So how can we keep these costs down? Mary's Means takes the food to the school. But before they do that, the school has to come up with a plan. And the plan is very strict, and we are strict in enforcing this. The school must provide us with a nota of people who will collect the firewood, who will collect the, the water, I will look at people who will do the cooking and people who will clean up and leave things ready for the next day. That means it's not the Westerner coming in and providing everything for the native. No, we are providing the food, but they are providing the manpower. So it's the children's older brothers and sisters, sometimes their parents, very often their grandparents or aunts and uncles who are providing sort of the manpower to make this possible. And Mary's meetings are very good at going into the schools unannounced to check that the food is being used properly, that things are being done clean and in a sanitized way, and that everything is in order as we, we see it. When we went into areas first in 2002, especially up to the 2007, what used to happen, you would go into a school What's the local school here? Yeah. 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 Is there another school around? Yeah. 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 The convent. Yeah. Right, so Mary's Mays would go into St. Michael's, right? And we'd provide meetings. So the school population might be 300. And after three months of providing the school, the school population is 2,000. And the poor convent is closed. <laughs> Because wouldn't you rather go to get food? If you go to school anyway, you might as well go and get food as well. So what was happening to people were coming to the school where the various meetings were providing and, and this wasn't good. It wasn't good for the whole overall situation and it wasn't good for the school communities. So now because we've got better at what we do, instead of going into a school, we're going to the whole school district. And so all the schools in the area are not going to and each other in, in the food line only like every school in the educational line. So the, the people provide the, the manpower to make it possible to provide these meetings for 15 euros and 60 cents for a full school year. So our school feeding program is working now in 18 different countries. Malawi is the biggest. By the end of this year, it is in places that 
PhDs talking about providing needs in Malawi at the rate of one million children. One million children in Malawi alone. The second biggest is Liberia, followed by Haiti. We also have in India and other countries that you've probably never heard of me, being V-E-I-N-A. I had to look it up in the map when I heard it the first time, and you were aware of it. So, maybe these we provide food in schools so that the child is attracted to a school. But not alone is the child attracted, the parents want the children to go to school because now that's a mouth they don't have to worry about today. Now, hopefully the parents will provide something in the morning and something in the evening. So it's not like the, that the Westerners come in and say, we're the solution to your problem. But together, we're providing help for the whole solution. And so, what this 1.4 million children being fed every day in a place of education, there is another side to Haley's needs, and that side is us. We have uh, what we call donor countries, the feeding countries are called program countries, where we're providing our program, and we are donor countries. So the overall body of Haley's needs is called Haley's Needs International, and they're responsible for giving the money to Liberia, Haiti, to uh, Malawi and so on, so that the people in Malawi can buy the food in Malawi, the people in Haiti can buy it in Haiti, and so on. Some countries, unfortunately, are not fit to provide enough food, even if you are paying for it. There's, there, there are all, uh, food negative, they're not producing enough food to feed their own people, so that they have to go to other countries. But for the majority of the time, we try and buy food in the country where the children are being fed. That means that the local farmers are, are getting on a little bit better and the local economy is doing a little bit better. In order for Mage Means International to provide for these uh, vast amounts of children being fed, we need donor companies. So we have what we call affiliates and there are affiliates growing up thankfully in many different countries now. Mage Means in Scotland is still the biggest provider to Mage Means International and then the UK in, in general. Ireland is in there. And thankfully we became an independent affiliate uh, a year and a half ago. And so we, we try in various Meets Ireland to provide uh, funds for various Meets International so that they can buy the food. And what we do is listen to everybody and to everybody. Come up with an idea and we'll definitely give it an ear. So in various Meets we have a young man who jumped out of an airplane for us with a parachute, Harry from County Leo. He also uses a wheelchair. <laughs> we have guest teas. So people might take somebody in for, for uh, a, a guest tea. Uh, my sister runs one for us. She invites people in uh, and, and they all get a lovely cup of tea with a wee envelope sitting in the room. <laughs> Table quizzes, sing songs, fashion shows. We don't, uh, you heard of the X Factor? Mm -hmm. Well, we got the M Factor. So we got uh, 10 people to go up and sing songs or juggle or whatever it was. And then <laughs> you had to vote for the best one. And you voted by paying the euro. Mm -hmm. So you really wanted somebody thought their wee garden was the best. <laughs> and had to keep the competition going. Nearly everything and anything we listen to, people come up with all sorts of lovely and wonderful ideas. Nearest Meetings in Ireland last year provided 556,000 uh, euros to, to Nearest Meetings International. Overall, Nearest Meetings International spent last year just over 19 million sterling on providing the, the food. And we're guaranteeing that 93 cents at least in every euro collected goes directly to our charitable costs. So we do have a paid staff, but most of us are not paid. We, we depend on the volunteers. And so a night like this here, uh, nobody takes anything. Anything that is collected or anything that, that's given goes directly into the Irish Leeds Ireland. And then when that figure goes up over 20,000, Please pass over to Mary's Meets International. You speak me up so far? Yeah. Yeah. Should, should I clarify any of that? No. All right. So Mary's Meets Ireland, we're strong living on. We're 
And that's what we planned last year, that we would try and get more groups in the country. So thankfully we have Mary's Beats East in Kevin, Mary's Beats East Kevin, and Mary's Beats West Kevin. You know what the division is for, but anyway, that's what it is. We have Mary's Beats in Auckland, and we have uh, hopefully Mary's Beats in London. We have Mary's Beats set up in Dublin, just to, uh, to pretend Mary's Beats are set up, but at least we've got a set up in that sort of thing. Gradually we're going down the country. We have Mary's Beats in Chew, and there's a Mary's Beats. Mary's Beads uh, groups, the idea is that we would set it up and that people would take an interest in it. Nobody can do everything. No matter how enthusiastic one might be, you work on it to be mapped away. Looking for funds is a hard <coughs> job. My sister says, oh, Ian, yeah, it's great to see you. What are you looking for? <laughs> you know, it's hard work. To, you know, because you, you have to say people that's why a group works much better, because what one can do, the other can't do, and what the other can't do, the first one can do, and that's the way it works. And uh, uh, if, if we can set up a wee group, they'll meet roughly every six weeks or every two months, whatever the group decided. And they would uh, have uh, fundraisers, and lots of people have ideas, how to run a concert, how to do or how to do a draw, a wee Easter draw there in the home, my own parish at the moment, to get over a thousand euros, two euros a time. It's amazing what can be done. At the minute we're, we're planning a, a concert in October the 27th to celebrate our 10th anniversary in the week. So different people have different ideas. And the idea was the group is that there would be a chairperson, a secretary, and somebody would take care of the finances, and somebody would take care of taking notes of and believing in a secretary. The idea of finance sometimes scares people, but what Mary's means we try to get the scariness out of it. Any group that is set up will never be left on their own. There will always be support. We're all in this together. Mary's means at Ireland is only as strong as the weakest group. So we, we're in this together. It's an our interest support any group at all. And the finances is the one that scares most groups, so we make that very simple. Mary's Beats in Ireland has one bank account and one bank account only. It's in Carrick and Shannon. Everything counted in Letter County, Tullamore, Tube, is lodged into that account. Nobody keeps money. Isn't that happen? It's the way they worry. We don't want, we don't want Mary's Beats to have a all over the place. There's only one account in Dublin. Even, there's only one account in there. Even the, the Dublin people lodge to the Carrick and Shannon account. And it was set up in Carrick and Shannon because that's where the, the first we group met in Carrick and Shannon. So, if you are interested in finding out more about various means, there's leaflets. You may already have these ones. Right? There's also wee magazines here that Mary's Beats uh, produce in different years. But if you're really interested in Mary's Beats and, and what we do, this is Magnus's book. Magnus wrote a book, uh, the, uh, the Shed of Fed Million Children. He still uses, when he wants to work with Mary's Beats, and especially when he's trying to think of ideas and that, he still go to this shed. And it is a shed that uh, his father got way back years ago. And the uh, Magnus Borrows. And this one, we were over there in Dunbarry a few weeks ago. We were in the shade and we were discussing Mary's Beads Ireland and how we might expand Mary's Beads Ireland. And I said, well, we're, we're trying to set up different groups. And he thinks that's a great idea and a great way to 
sort of played it down. And who would be interested in this? Just another charity, a story of another charity. Why do you want to produce a book anyway? And Magda says, well, I really want to produce a book for three reasons. I want to record the beginnings of various means, and I want the opportunity to record it. I want to raise the profile of Mary Speeds and hopefully get more people to know the story. And I want to give glory to God. And the man says, we don't get that a reason very often in here. We give glory to God. So, Magnus uh, wrote this book. So, sometimes you wonder why people respond. Judy, Magnus' wife, was over in the post one day and she brought her this letter, handwritten, and inside the, the letter was a note. I read the book. It's a great story. Keep doing whatever you're doing because it's working. And use the enclosed as you see fit. And enclosed was a bank trap for one of the minister. It's amazing what happens when people tell the story. Because Mary's Meads is making a difference. It is giving children who would otherwise have no hope. hope. People who would be gone, except for Mary's Meads, are now living full there's an international footballer, he plays for Malawi. He has a name, but I'm not even going to try and say it because I couldn't say it outside of the name, it's the wrong name. He was interviewed by one of the Scottish papers and he said, Mary Speeds is a great organisation. Only for Mary Speeds, I would not be playing international. In fact, he says, if I'm truthful, only for various needs, I would not be playing football. But if I'm totally honest, only for various needs, I would not be in it. Various needs is making a difference. It is creating the possibility of new life for people. In Northern Ireland, um, Patricia Polly McCormick She's a great woman of faith and she was, she had heard of Mary Speeds, she liked it but didn't bite it right away. And she was at a prayer meeting and at the prayer meeting a woman got up and she took the Bible and she read the story of the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. I went on to say, I read somewhere in a magazine about this charity called Mary Speeds and they are doing great work. And Polly says, well that's not God talking to me, I don't know what it is. So she started the Mary Speeds group and she has raised quite a bit of money for Mary Speeds. But she has also gathered around her a great team of people. When Magnus was going to the schools, he noticed that in the developing world, no matter how good the teacher are, they have so little facilities that it's very difficult to, for the children to retain the information that they're receiving. And so Magnus came up with a secondary thing. Now we are a school feeding program and that's what we do, feed children in school. But he came up with a secondary program and it's called the Back. So, when our children, here in this country,
they take a factory producing backpack project, but they've also raised money
not a community. And so instead of uh, no wages, they're paying free wages. And so that's why it's so hard to keep it going. Whereas we are determined to keep it uh, on the ground, grassroots. The same way with in, in the, uh, the fundraising, you will see that many of the charities will, will only look for government assistance and so on. And the HBs will not be foolish enough not to, but this is what we do most of the time. We encourage ordinary people to get them wrong. And, and that's what it's about. It's about if somebody gives you a pound or a euro for the HBs, it's a pound we didn't have. We say thanks. We're not saying, oh, could you not give us two? <laughs> We say thanks, and that's it. And that's amazing what happens then with all the roads, and it's amazing. I never thought I would be doing this type of work. I never thought it could be could be encourage people to, to get involved in the charity, to give up themselves. Because I joke, I joke among my friends, I say, this is the charity that keeps me good. You know? <laughs> but it's worth while you think in the future. You know what? Charity 31 or Generation hope, but if you listen to Magnus talk, if you just Google Magnus McFarland Barrow, especially on YouTube, there's lots of things. He's interviewed with so many stations, EWTN and CNN. He's one of the CNN heroes. He's one of Times Magazine's 100 most influential people. And he is the most humble man. If he walked into this room with me and I was talking to the he would not be He would sit there and 
and do accept there are many charities. I'm sorry, speaking of charities, there were millions that were getting. Uh, millions upon millions, and still there uh, was documented on the government system that came there. Um, there's a foundation, but millions after there, but they did take the big subsidies that were done. There's actually a Thank you. 